So economic fundamentals, right? We're, we're, we're risk averse as investors. We, we're investors first, right? So we look at what are the fundamentals of all these different asset classes and why would I like to go into it, right? So a story that you'll probably hear me talk about a lot is in 2007, 2008, when the market crashed, my dad lost about half of his wealth that he had acquired over his lifetime. He also had cancer at the time. He passed away over the next couple of years, did not get to ride the market all the way back up to where it is now. So when you see that level of volatility, right, and you start to recognize that it doesn't matter over time how the market does, it really matters when you die, where's, where does, where's the music stop and where are you in that economic cycle? And if you're on the downswing, too bad. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Campfire Capitalism. I'm your host, Desmond Dixon. And today we have no Heather, no Josh. You just have me and another rock star real estate investor. This guy is a living legend. He is the host of the Free Wall Street, Free from Wall Street podcast. The man had 15 years as a realtor, left that because he was tired of working for, for someone else. And then did flips and wholesales of a, over a thousand deals, guys, over a thousand deals until he realized he was paying so much in taxes and was pretty much gave himself a high, a high paying job that he decided to switch the game up and get into commercial real estate. And now he holds over or close to $200 million in real estate and his portfolio. So his name is Mr. Steven Littman. What's up, Steven? Hey, Desmond. Thanks, man. What an intro. Sounds weird when you say it like that, but yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Heck yeah, man. Yo, I gotta be your hype, man. I'm, I'm, I'm all for I'm all for what you're doing. You're doing this, what you're doing is awesome. So hey man, before we like dive into any game and like, you know, how you you know can, can get into this commercial real estate game, just kind of give us an idea of your story. And you know what your journey was um, going from realtor to to investor. Yeah, so I graduated from Boston University in two thousand and four. Was it a degree in real estate? No. Did I get an MBA in finance? No. I got a degree in sociology from Boston University. So liberal arts education. Came out, started, wanted to be you know in sales. Knew I'd be in sales. Worked in Manhattan for a couple of years, just slinging whatever we could get our hands on to make sure that we could pay the bills. And then just the commute was killing me in Manhattan. So I was living in Jersey at the time. So um, became a realtor said, Hey, you know, I, I think being a realtor would be cool. I can work for myself kind of. And I did that for a couple of years. It was a real estate agent. And then a broker, we were selling properties through the downturn. I was sourcing good deals for other investors that were bank owned in 2007, 2008, 2009. And, uh, one of, one of my clients actually made me pay for a pool letter that was missing at one of our closings. I bought, I found him like five properties that year. He was going to make probably seven hundred to $800,000 in net profits off the deals that I brought him. And he held my feet to the fire on a $400 pool ladder that went missing right before closing, meaning I had to pay for it out of my commission. And he would not close until I did that. So I begrudgingly said, okay, no problem. I'm going to pay for it. And that was the day I decided that I wasn't going to be a realtor anymore. So met my business partner, Travis. Um, he trained my dog, ironically enough, and that's how we met. He was doing underground utility and putting in sewer and water pipes, which was pretty cool. And I was being a realtor and we got together and we said, hey, you know, why don't we do some some of this wholesaling type stuff or flipping and we can build a little business plan. And, and um, we did. We sold our first property for $16,000. We put a property under contract, sold it to another investor, made 16 grand. He took eight, I took eight. And we said, hey, this business could work. Let's go to Costa Rica and talk about it. So we did. We went to Costa Rica. He went for a month. He was not married at the time. He went to go surf. Me and my wife went down there. And on the, on the beaches of Costa Rica, we decided that life is too short. We're going to come home. We're going to burn the boats. We're going to start the business. We're going to leave our W-2 jobs. And we did. And the next couple of years was a little bit of a struggle. We were learning how to build a business. We weren't listening to podcasts. We didn't have any mentors. So we were doing it the hard way. Uh, in hindsight, it's the dumb way. But we were just trying to figure it out 
on our own. And, you know, I think in 2015, we flipped about 15 houses between wholesales and flips. And it was an absolute grind and we didn't make a ton of money and we paid a lot in taxes. Uh, we joined a mastermind group. The next year we did 75 deals. The deal year after that, we did about 140 deals. So we've got around some smart people that were a little bit further ahead than we were. And then over the next oh, four or five years, we flipped about a thousand houses. And um, again, just getting around smart people doing, doing big things and found that we were in a very highly taxed, highly transactional type of business. And that if we didn't figure out a way to turn that active income into passive income, we were going to work forever and started to learn a little bit more about um, the tax code and how it's not really like a boogeyman waiting in the shadows to jump out at you, but it's actually a book of rules that you can abide by to pay less taxes legally. And once we started to learn a little bit about depreciation and commercial real estate and, and some of the other things that can help decrease your tax bill legally, um, then we decided to, to go after that. Our first deal, we did a $12 million, 180,000 square foot ground up self-storage facility in Orlando. It was uh, 1,183 units. It was managed by CubeSmart. We sold that property along with two other new construction builds that we did in Orlando uh, last year. And since then, we've bought about 1,000 multifamily units. We're under contract on... Um, nearing $90 million worth of property. And, you know, our goal is to acquire another 200 million this year. So that's been kind of the genesis of the business. So I have so many questions, man. So um, it sounds like you have like a ton of experience at all different types of layers in the real estate game. And so, you know, a question I have for you is because particularly of a lot of entrepreneurs, maybe some executives, not a lot of you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, seasoned investors who might be uh, intimidated by, you know, doing such large deals. So like from a, you know, from a deal perspective or from your, from your experience, I mean, what's kind of the biggest, you know, di differentiators in terms of like the amount of skill you need between like wholesaling a deal versus fixing and flipping to doing the commercial. So like, what are some of like some of the key differences or, or, you know, the, the amount of knowledge or experience or, you know, what are some things that you can talk to us about there? I'm going to tell you something that you've heard before, right? And it's mindset. The, the, the biggest difference between the $80,000 first deal that we did where we made 15 grand on it and sold it for 95,000 and the $71 million project that we're purchasing right now is just the understanding that you can do the deal right? That's the first hurdle you need to clear. If you don't think you can buy a $50 million building, you're not going to do it, right? If you don't think you can buy a $100 million building, you're not going to do it. And obviously that comes with confidence and skill over time, right? It's never a light switch. The man on top of the mountain didn't land there. You have to acquire skills and relationships to get to that next level. But more, more so than anything is you have to believe that you can do that. And that is something that is meant for you, right? I mean, I know a lot of folks that will never do those deals just because they don't believe that that's for them. And that's okay. If, if you're making a living in the 80 to hundred thousand dollar a year flip, you know, type of thing, that's, that's fine for me. You know, the more zeros means the less deals I can do for the same amount of effort, right? We just launched a hundred million dollar uh, equity fund that we're raising a hundred million dollars into to purchase $400 million plus of real estate. And you know, we've already raised and deployed about 55 million in the last three years. Um, but that's a very big difference, right? That's a lot more zeros than the $80,000 deal that we were doing. So, you know, the first thing is, is the belief, right? The second thing is seeing other people doing it. I mean, if you've read the story of the four minute mile, nobody broke the four minute mile. And then one person did and like three guys right after him broke the four minute mile. It was just this mindset issue of, oh, I can do that too. And I've met some amazing mentors and some amazing friends that were a little bit further and faster down the, the track than we were. And we said, oh, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. And, you know, so that, that's the biggest hurdle, right? The skill set that you need to understand how to become like a fund manager, right? These are, these are skills that, I mean, we're just still acquiring today. Like, how do you manage the back office of these things? How are you managing the investor relations? How are you underwriting those deals? How are you? And it's just talent. It's either you're going to learn the skill or you're going to hire the talent to do it. And, 
you know, at first, I think when you're an entrepreneur, you have to, you're doing smaller deals because you probably don't have a lot of liquidity. You don't have a lot of capital behind you. So you can't go out and hire that rock star yet. Um, so you do a lot of it yourself and then you start to hire people on and then you go from small business owner and entrepreneur to business owner. And you need to recognize that you have to get out of your own way because the business is only going to grow to your skill set, right? The business is only going to grow as much as you do. So, you know, I feel like every successful person at some point becomes like a philosopher, right? They really start talking about what is most interesting about how you grow a business, not necessarily how you tactically grow a business. Because frankly, if you don't grow and you don't have accountability and those core values don't exist in you, you won't grow past that point. Um, the business will only grow to the leader and the lid of the leader. But after you get to a certain point, you go, hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm doing everything, but I have to be a business owner. So I have to grow different skill sets now. I have to hire, manage, fire, and you know, effectively lead people. How do I do that? Right? How do I get that top talent? How do I get those people to believe in our business? And how do I get them to leave you know, major Fortune 500 companies to come work with us? Different skill set. So I would say that there's, you know, it, there's been 11 years in the making of learning what is different, right? Five years before that of understanding real estate in general. But, you know, you, you have to understand some of the, the simplest tactics of sales, underwriting, dispositions, leadership, management. And uh, that's what the bookcase behind you is, right? It's just that all that information is out there. You just need to figure out how to find, um, find that information and then apply it. Got it. Got it. You mentioned a lot about one thing I've noticed is in your journey, particularly you mentioned at the beginning that last response was getting the right people around you who are where you aspire to be, right? To help you get there faster. And so talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, how to find the right people in a real estate space to, you know, learn from or, or work with. Because sometimes the best, sometimes the best place is finding someone else and being a value to them, right? Of like, hey, like, just don't come and say, can I take from you? Like, what, bring them a deal or just want to part of the past, bring them a deal or, you know, go out, rub elbows, be honest, don't be someone you're not. So like, you know, from your, your perspective, like, you know, what was some of those, like those networks or what was some of your approach to like, you know, surround yourself with the right people to set you up to be successful faster at least? Yeah, I mean... The thing that I've noticed about this business in particular is there's such an abundance mindset. People are willing to help. People are willing to spend time. Now, I'm not saying that you should go openly looking to steal somebody's time, but overwhelmingly, there are people in this business that have given me 10 minutes, an hour, two hours of their time where they didn't need to just to kind of share some information with me that I could tactically go about. Um, finding partners and, and things like that. So first for me, we were in a single family mastermind to figure out the flip game, right? And probably 5% of those guys rose to the place where we said, hey, we want to also do multifamily. Um, social media is a fantastic place. You have a big network, right? Especially if you're getting involved in some of these uh, multifamily deals or self-storage deals or you know, go to conferences, go to... Um, I mean, there's, there's so many ways to get around people that are doing the business, right? And then it's simply, who do you know, like, and trust? Who fits your core values? Who can you be open and honest with and, and find if you can add value to their business? Um, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, right? It really is just getting out there and talking to people and finding out who's in the business. And I always like to find out, like, how did you get started in the business? How did you get to where you were at? And most of these guys pay for masterminds, right? They get involved to a, to a mastermind group and then they learn how to underwrite. They learn how to build broker relationships and go out and find deals. They learn how to do all kinds of different things, right? Fund management is a whole separate world than just acquisitions and syndication. So it's just that simple, right? You're, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not creating anything new under the sun. So just go out there, find the people that are attending what conferences, that are listening to what podcasts that are, you know, just getting in the right Facebook groups, talking to people on LinkedIn. There's, there's we're, we're everywhere, right? And the world gets very small when you start talking to a bunch of people. Um, 
and see how many people are out there doing exactly what you want to do. And then you get to just ask them some questions. Man, I think that there's something, um, being a sales guy, I think that there is something about when people pay, they like really pay attention, right? And they really get committed. And then also, you also get access, you get, you know, one step closer internally because you made that that commitment internally. So now you have skin in the game. And then on top of that, you're also getting access to information that could shorten, you know, your path to, you know, the successful outcome that you're searching for. So, you know what, guys, if you listen to this, just pay, guys. Simple, right? Like, yes, but you're going to pay for it. In my opinion, you're going to pay for it one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to pay for it in mistakes. You're going to pay for it in time, or you're going to pay for it in mentorship. The fastest, cleanest, easiest way to do that is certainly by writing a check to somebody smarter than you. Yeah. And getting the playbook straight up, um, straight up. So I love that. Um, so I got, I got one question in because, you know, we're talking about a, a lot about the business side of this. And I think it's important to really unpack this because you mentioned that the, the mindset is really important because it's essentially the container or your, or your limits of how far your business can go. Um, so let's talk about like the, the, what I like to call the engine of that mindset, which is the purpose, right? So what's the purpose behind, you know, you and your business personally? Yeah. So for us, I mean, we spent years honing this vision, right? As to why we do what we do. And I think 95% of entrepreneurs are going to tell you it's for their family. And that's probably partially true. Um, your purpose and your passion is what's going to drive you through those long, hard, tumultuous seasons in business, right? So if you haven't written down your why, right? And studied it and really figured out what your purpose is, when hard times come, right? That's when you get knocked down and maybe not get back up. But during those seasons where things are really tough, your why will always keep you going. So for us, we own a, uh, we run a donor advised fund, which is essentially a way to fund nonprofits around the world. Um, if you've read Collins and you know what a BHAG is, your big, hairy, audacious goal, those are like the things that are not time constrained, but it's our biggest, like what if we could do anything, what would we do? And that's what we're all rowing in the same direction for. It's to give 80% of our profits away through our donor advised fund. Now, we also want to live a comfortable life, right? So you can do the math and what that is for you, but giving 80% to a donor advised fund so that we can fund many nonprofits around the world and, and really help and create a big impact while also creating amazing returns for our investor is, is the why behind what we do. And we've been able to do some really incredible things. I mean, today is, where are we? It's April 4th. Um, you know, we've been able to supply pastors that are driving in and out of Kiev right now with trucks and bulletproof vests that are saving orphans and women in the middle of a war zone, actively doing that. Like today, while we chat, there will be 60 to 80 people saved from a war zone. We've dug wells in Western Kenya. We've been able to... Um, put a 757 filled with refugees in the Afghan air airfield when that base got shut down in Bagram. Um, we've been able to save some girls from sex trafficking in the Philippines. You know, we're, we're doing all kinds of incredible things and not like putting our hand to the plow, but being able to write the check so that the people that are on the front lines can do that. And this business specifically, I think creates a lot of passive cash flow and a lot of upside to where we can really make a dent in the need that's in and around the world. And uh, that's the, the why behind what we do. Dude, that is um, um, incredible. Uh, that's, man, that's incredible. Like you are essentially focused on like, how can I make a change, like immediate change? Like for instance, the, the, key, of, the, the key thing, like you're saying, hey, we know how many people is being transported like almost every day or every week with the amount of support that we're giving to the organization or, 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 or you know, to the people who are operating um, those causes, man. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, philanthropy is a big thing, you know, charity is a big thing, but like, it sounds like you're like lasering in on very specific topics or issues and making sure that the money is being spent in a way that, it, you know, is in alignment with your beliefs and, uh, 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 you know, operational excellence. So like, how do you vet those, those opportunities though. So, you know, do you, you know, have some people that you worked with at that foundation? Like, how do you like come across 
Like, how do you allocate that capital efficiently? Which is essentially what I'm asking, I guess. Yeah. So it's a good question. Actually, one of my full-time employees, she just handles the donor advised fund now. And that's grown into it, right? It started at two hours a week and then four and then eight and then 20, right? And that's all she does is communicate with these nonprofits. And let me tell you, if you if you started reaching out to your network and said, hey, I'm looking to give abundantly through my business, the needs just flow, right? There's no shortage of need in the world, unfortunately. And all of our nonprofits so far have been through maybe one degree of separation. Most of them we directly know. Um, so, you know, we, you probably don't even know how many people you, that are in your circle that are just one degree of separation or even involved in nonprofits themselves that say, hey, I have a need, right? And you're able to say, oh, okay, well, through our donor advised fund, we would like to partner with you for the next five years. And this is how much we're willing to give you. Um, so yeah, there's no shortage of need. So that people just come to us um, and we don't really have to reach out very often to say, hey, we have you know more money that we'd like to give away. It, it's really, you, you could work as much as you want, become a multi-billionaire and never have the ability to satisfy all the need in the world. So there's plenty of opportunity to give. So Charity Nav- Navigator, if, you, you know, if you're thinking about starting a donor advised fund, I encourage you through your business. You don't have to start giving millions of dollars away right now. The way that we started was we gave 1% ownership of a deal that we did um, of cash flow and upside to the donor advised fund, right? So 66 units, 1%, not a lot of money, but you know what? It probably gave two or $3,000 that first year. Um, the next deal we did was 2%. The next deal was five. The next deal was 10. The next deal was 20, right? And it's, um, it continues to grow. So you can start now is my point. And, you know, you can go to, uh, you can just Google how to start a donor advised fund. There's a couple of organizations that can help you do it very simply. We use uh, NCF, which is National Christian Foundation. The cool thing about working with a foundation like that is they vet your nonprofits as well. So they're making sure that the 501c3 paperwork is in order. They're making sure that, you know, they're, they're on Charity Navigator and have a certain level of um, transparency and accountability along with that nonprofit. Uh, for us, it wasn't a big deal yet because we personally knew most of these nonprofits. But as we continue to grow, that will be a, a nice piece of it, right? So that, that was our goal is like, how do we start today before we get quote unquote there, right? Before we have a $30 million a year business, how are we giving now? Right. And, uh, and that's just kind of what, what was presented to us is like, well, you can start now, right. And just partner with the donor advice fund on every deal and then increase in the giving as you continue to acquire more deals. Man. Okay. I can't let this go before we move on. I got to, I got to ask one last question just to wrap my head around, especially for our, our audience here. So are you essentially writing in the, like, the f- actual uh, donor advice fund into the deals itself. So it's its own separate thing. Or yeah, so is it initially, like, yeah. in- initially, that's what we were doing, right? But there's some caveats tax wise, right? You, you create what they call UBIT, which is unintended business income tax for nonprofits if you were to actually put them into the deal. So what we do is just we internally track what the economic benefit of that percentage would be. And it flows through the business and then it flows to the donor advised fund. So that's simply for taxation purposes. But essentially that is what we're doing, right? We're saying at the beginning of this deal, we're gonna give them 20% of the cash flows and 20% of the upside when we sell the deal. And then we just track that internally so that we can move that money from the business account into the donor advised fund account. Oh, so you're just passing through a sick. Um, no. Okay. All right. So let's, let's skip on to, um, that was sick, man. Like you're, man, I I haven't heard anyone in real estate that is doing what you're doing. And that's a freaking humongous goal. Like you start off at 1%. I I think you mentioned you're doing like what, 80% now at some point. So for some, the BHAG is 80 right now we're doing so far we're up to 20, but that's in only 30 months. We're, we're, in about, I'm pretty sure in about, you know, a decade, you're going to be doing like Blackstone numbers. So we're, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So let's talk a little bit about some of this commercial real estate. So you mentioned that you guys did some storage facilities. You do some multifamilies. Um, so like, talk to me about like, you know, why you love storage facilities so much. And, you, you know, why do you love storage? Let's start there because that's kind of a, a super niche, um, you know, kind of area in commercial real estate. 
So economic fundamentals, right? We're, we're, we're risk averse as investors. We, we're investors first, right? So we look at what are the fundamentals of all these different asset classes and why would I like to go into it, right? So a story that you'll probably hear me talk about a lot is in 2007, 2008, when the market crashed, my dad lost about half of his wealth that he had acquired over his lifetime. He also had cancer at the time. He passed away over the next couple of years, did not get to ride the market all the way back up to where it is now. So when you see that level of volatility, right, and you start to recognize that it doesn't matter over time how the market does, it really matters when you die, where's where does where's the music stop and where are you in that economic cycle? And if you're on the downswing, too bad. So we were looking to insulate ourselves from volatility, right? Real estate historically is the best thing to do that in. And also recognize that commercial real estate and residential real estate are very different. So in 2008, 2009, when the economic crisis was taking place, you had uh, somewhere in the vicinity of a 7% mortgage default rate that created the domino effect for the financial crisis, right? So that means about 7% of all homeowners were in some level of default in their mortgage. The multifamily space was 0.4% mortgage default rate. And so, so hear that again. Your neighbors were 7% mortgage default rate. Apartment buildings were 0.4%, right? So significantly different in the economics and the volatility of residential just to commercial. So forget about just like taking real estate as a whole because it's not. Further than that, right, the self-storage mortgage default rate was like 0.07. So that's what we like to call a sticky business, right? As people are losing their houses, you have to figure they're going to not throw away the macaroni art, right? They got to put it in storage. So storage facilities for the last decade have blown up. And that's why we're a nation of hoarders and it's a sticky business. Once you pay that 89 to $109 a month, you're just not, you're probably not going to visit your stuff very often, but it's going to stay there and you're going to pay for it. So it's a recession resistant asset class. And that's why we went into storage first, because we knew it was a recession resistant asset class. Second to that is multifamily, which we really like. And then finally, our fund mandate also allows us to go into senior housing and simply senior because you have 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring right now. In the next 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to have a significant increase and need for senior housing facilities across the country. So we're bullish on senior multi and storage. Man, that's so sick. You mentioned like, it's so funny. You're, you're talking about people are a nation of hoarders. Like right now I'm traveling the world and guess what we did? We put all our stuff into storage. <laughs> so it's like, I'm paying. But you so have much. a valid reason, right? Like you guys have a valid reason. I know people with 4,000 square foot houses that have a 10 by 20 storage unit. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And it's not like they're going to come pick that stuff up any anytime soon either. I bet. So like the retention is probably crazy. Out there, right? Retention yeah. is crazy. This is, this is so sick. This is so interesting. So um, let me ask you this though. So based upon, you know, what you do as a fund, as you do as an, as an investor, are you focused on finding deals of like existing infrastructure or do you do any kind of new builds as well? Like development? So we've done both. We were owner operators, right? Which is what your typical operator that you talk to is, where they will go out, they'll build the broker relationships, they're going to acquire the deal, they're going to operate the deal. And we've done that. Um, as you continue to do that, you recognize very quickly that to be successful as an owner operator, you also need to build out an asset and property management team and arm. So that becomes almost a business within the business, right? Where our secret sauce is and what we're really good at is talking to investors and letting them know that this opportunity exists. So we've moved into the fund structure where we are strictly the capital, right? Where we come in and we partner with guys that have 30, 40 years experience, a billion dollars of assets under management. They're a vertically integrated account company that has the asset and property management arms already built out, extenuous um, track record that frankly we didn't have, right? And then we hitch our wagon to those sponsors and we come in and we fund the deal. Our fund uh, is filled with limited partners that make a, a, a certain percentage return on their investment. And then we co-sponsor the deal with that partner, meaning we co-own it and operate it. So it, um, it does a couple of things. One, it um, 
consolidates the size team that we that we need, right? It lets us work in our sweet spot, which is going out and finding investors that are interested in these types of deals and explaining it to them. And then it mitigates the downside risk by only investing with partners with you know, really long track records and a lot of experience because in this environment, right, you have inflationary environment, interest rates are climbing. The biggest threat, I think, to our money and to our investors' capital is lack of experience in going through a market cycle like this, right? And the last 10 years, frankly, have been really good, right? So as people prepare for different things that they're going to have to navigate, first and foremost is higher interest rates. Um, having the experience of gone through the late eighties with 16, 17% interest rates, those are the guys you want on your team, right? Those are the guys that you want to fund because they know how to navigate those and underwrite those and make sure that they're getting long-term debt, not getting a bridge to nowhere with some of these new construction builds or even some of these bridge, um, debt deals that you have to do a, a huge value add. So, you know, again, we're, we're investors first. Our money is in the fund alongside with our investors. So we're looking at this as how do we mitigate our downside risk? And that's how we underwrite the deals. That's how we underwrite the sponsors. And that's how we deploy capital. Got it. So it sounds like more like you're doing like joint ventures, essentially. Yeah. Eventually yep. our fund is a JV fund. Mm -hmm. Yep. Got it. Man, that's so cool. Um, and so you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you, you're, you're, <laughs> you're open to almost, you know, any area around the United States. You guys just focus on like one geography, essentially, like, you know, you guys everywhere. Or... So we're geographically agnostic, but we do have a predilection for where economies are growing and populations are moving. Right. So like we don't invest in New Jersey, New York and California. There's a mass exodus there. It's tough to be a landlord there. Um, so, you know, everybody and their mother is bullish on Texas and Florida. Of course we are, too. But we like the Southeast and the Sun Belt. So, you know, it's not to say that we would not do deals other places, but the economics have to make sense, right? I need to see population growth steady over the last couple of years with a census projection that it's going to continue to grow. And that's usually driven by economic factors like new businesses moving in and business friendly environments and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it, man. Like Heather always says, business is just good math, right? Like you mentioned, Something I'm noticing, like the pattern in this, you know, in this talk is like you're talking about surrounding yourself with the right people, understanding your risk, right? And, you know, full disclosure, I feel like I talked about this in the last podcast. Well, I've learned some lessons around like being an aggressive, ambitious guy. Like I've taken some risks even though I'm young and I'm learning those lessons in real time right now. Like I'm not going to be grounded out. I'm not hurting, but like it hurt enough where my network took a hit. And I'm like, yo, like, all right, I learned the difference, like risk, like don't lose money, right? Like more about the says, right? Like don't lose money. Like yeah, that should be one. my, don't lose money. That should be the first filter <laughs> in my, like my, you know, my mental model like for, for investments. Um, dude, this is so sick. So, all right, I'm going to ask you this. This is a fun question, man. This is a fun question. So if you were given two different deals, one is a multifamily, one is a self-storage, and they had the same number side by side, which one would you choose? Man, it's hard. It's hard to, um, to just say, okay, this is, this is the type of deal that we would do. Right. Um, cause there's so many different economic variables typically, but personally I like to create housing for people. So, you know, storage is a great business. It's sticky. It has great net operating incomes, but I like the fact that we can also make an impact on the couple hundred families that live in the environments that we're purchasing. So just from a, you know, just, just from an operational standpoint, I like the fact that, you know, if we're buying a 385 unit building, you can impact 385 families in a positive way. So if I had to choose and the numbers were the same, I'd go multifamily. Okay. All right. That's that. I was, I was, I was thinking you were going to go to storage, but I love that answer. That was heart centered. Um, this is so sick. So, all right. Last question before we, before we, you know, head into the, to the, to the value run. Um, so have you like, talk, talk to me a little bit like value add, right? Cause you talk about like owning and operating you do ventures and you work with, you know, experienced people. Um, so like have like, are a lot of the deals that you do like, 
is it adding a little bit like un- unlocking a little bit of value from that property in order to like you do a lot of like cash out refinances or are you essentially like locking your capital in the property usually for a certain amount of time like Talk to me a little bit about that, like that that mechanism, your, your strategy. I'm interested about it. Yeah, so there's heavy value ads, right? And there's light value ads. The heavy value ads, typically you're looking to go in and spend a couple million dollars in CapEx and in two years, do that cash out refi, maybe give the capital back to the investor and stay in it for infinite returns. Well, in this environment specifically, unless you have a very strong underwriting and knowing, knowing where interest rates are going to go, that becomes a little bit more risky, right? So we lean towards more class B, B plus assets that are cash flowing that we could put 10 to 12 year debt on out of the gate um, and not worry about the cash out refi. You know, we're not looking to do the heavier value value ads. Like the last deal we just did um, 384 units. It was, um, it was already plumbed for washers and dryers to be in the units, but the previous owner ripped them all out and then put a central um, laundry facility in there. Well, we thought that was silly because the ones that did that still had the washer and dryer in the unit was getting a $45 a month rental premium. Well, times 384 units, that's pretty significant income. So that's what we did. Our CapEx plan was to go in, put washers and dryers back in the building, right? So, and we knew it was proven out. We knew that we could get the $45 extra a month for the convenience of having a washer and dryer in the unit. Um, so that's what I would consider a light value add, right? We're not doing major, major renovations. We're not taking vacant properties that have no occupancy and no cash flow. You know, we we want at least eighty five percent occupancy, hopefully ninety or better, um, with not a huge, huge value add that needs to get done. We're happy to to do renovations per unit on attrition when people move out. That's fine, um, but not like fifty percent occupied heavy lifts and war zones anymore, right? We're looking for class B, B plus, A minus types of properties. You know, we're really looking for buildings $35 million and up now. Um, you know, we, we used to buy buildings at two and a half million, but now we recognize that, you know, if it's two and a half or 50 million, it's actually the same amount of effort. So we're looking for, for more institutional grade quality investments that will hold uh, appreciation long-term. Man, dude, that's so sick. So I, I, I think this is a great, a great segment because I just talked to a friend um, a couple of days ago. I was calling him about something else for my dad's business to ask for a referral. And um, he started literally just start talking. You know how real estate guys are, man. Like construction guys. Like they just really start going to like talk about real estate investing in business and what projects he's working on. <laughs> and I'm like, of course, like I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, okay, all right. I'm curious. Tell me more. Because he owns his own like restoration business. So he's like going in, works for real estate, out of state real estate investors. And um, does like complete like gut jobs, like completely like, you know, turnkey, um, you know, construction work. And he was telling me that, um, so he wants to get into real estate investing now because he's essentially like the construction company doing all the work, but he's not getting any piece of the back end, the pie, the equity, the cash flow, everything like that. Sure. And so I was like, man, I'm curious. I'm, you know, I want to do business with, I was like, man, that's like, this might be a great partnership because he's like my best friend from high school. And so, um, you know, the reason I brought this up is because he's, he's in the day-to-day game so much and he brought something to my attention that I kind of already knew, but I didn't know like the amount of detail he knew, which was, um, which kind of goes into what you talked about, like our interest rates, which was like the supply chain issues and these like value adds. So a lot of people are borrowing money because they know that, you know, uh, um, with low interest rates, you know, they can refinance and, and, and all this, and he was pretty much saying that, like, you know, windows are taking four to six months, you know, like getting like some of the things that you need to put in a, a house or, or a complex to make it livable or like super long delay times. And so, like, you, yeah. you talk about like understanding your risk and you buying like, you know, you know, institutional grade properties that are essentially like, you know, you just continue, you can be a passive investor. It's like you're lowering your risk of like, hey, I'm not only um, going to expose myself to possible higher rates later, but also I don't have to deal with those supply chain headaches and, you know, uh, labor shortages and all these different things. And so that's what, that, I mean, when you say that, I mean, that that's something that came up for me. Um, so um, to kind of, you know, to kind of segue, because I think what you're doing is awesome, dude. Um, so to kind of segue a little bit, um, you know, what is like, if someone wants to get started and, this game or even invest in a commercial real estate, you know, into a fund. I mean, what's some advice that you'll give them if they're an entrepreneur with successful exit or, 
you know, sitting on sitting on, you know, you know, a couple hundred thousand or a million dollars, like what would you say to them how to get involved with real estate? I mean, there's so many ways, right? And we've done it all. We've done wholesales, we've done flips, now we're doing commercial. Like it, you have to determine, I think, how active and how passive you want to be. And there's no right or wrong answer to that, by the way. I know that Kiyosaki always talks about the cash flow quadrant and you want to be passive and all that stuff. But like, look, my business is active. I, I operate, I talk to operators all the time. I like that side of the business. Um, so really, you just have to determine how active and how passive you want to be. If you have a W-2 job or you just had a successful exit and you need to just put money to work and put soldiers on the field and you don't want to deal with the day-to-day, then funds and syndications are fantastic. The next step after you decide if you're going to be active or passive is find who you know, like, and trust. I mean, at the end of the day, this business is very much about relationship. And we've had great ones and we've had some not so great ones. And frankly, it's because we didn't spend the time up front vetting the people on, you know, you get married in some of these deals, right? You get into a fund, you're three, three to seven years on all this stuff. So you should like who you're working with. You should trust them, right? You should align with the core, the same core values that they do. And just getting on the phone and getting on a Zoom call and finding out who people are, getting belly to belly is even better, right? But find out who you know, like, and trust, and then decide whether or not the return profiles and the types of deals and all those things are, the, are, are aligning with what you want to do, right? I get people calling me all the time like, hey, Steve, I have a great opportunity in a mobile home park. Well, that's cool. It's just not my niche, right? I just, I'm not going to, I don't do that because there's, you can drown in opportunity, right? And there, so there's so much to, to think about and think about where you're going to place your capital and how active you're going to be. And finally, I'd also like to point out like, read the book Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. He's Robert Kiyosaki's CPA. He's the guy who taught me all the stuff that I know about not paying taxes. And you can go on my website and see my Facebook account. Like If you scroll through it, you'll see my negative tax return this year um, because the tax code is written to help you not pay taxes legally. So read that book, understand that and see how different investments will impact you tax wise. Because, you know, if you don't pay taxes and like before when I was flipping houses, I was paying 50% in taxes between federal and state. Well, now we don't pay hardly any, if not any. Um, When you get to keep twice the amount of money that you're earning, you get to create wealth much faster, right? So just understanding what your plan is and why you're doing what you're doing and how to cut the line and how to figure out who you're going to partner with. So I know that's a long-winded, not super clear answer, but I think that's an important couple of steps that people need to do to to figure out what type of investor they want to be. Man, it's to help summarize, if you just want to put money to work, give it to Steven. If you want to be an active investor, go like get boots in the ground, find mentors, find masterminds, find other like-minded people, like-minded people, like get your hands dirty, really like invest your time and also some money into understanding the game. Um, so it sounds like a super fun game. And then obviously go read, like you said, tax-free wealth. I'm literally about to go buy that book right now. Cause I just no full disclosure, Steve, I just had a call with my accountant, like right before, right before we shot <laughs> and I already know for sure. I got a tax bill coming dude, in 11 days, April 15th. <laughs> I already I know. know so well. I know the pain well. <laughs> oh, cringing over here. You tell them you're getting negative. I'm like, man, I'm about to pay. So, um, This was an awesome episode. So before we wrap up, like, how can people find you, man? Like, give us all the plugs, podcasts. How can people, you know, maybe get get involved with their fund? Let us know, man. Yeah. So go to integrityhg.com and you can sign up for the investor club there. You can listen to some podcast episodes there. We have some free like courses on, you know, how to be a passive investor um, and then just some cool blogs and just a bunch of information about all the things that we've learned over the last 10 or 12 years and investing in real estate. We're all over social media. Um, You can check us out on our podcast. It's called free from wall street. Um, But yeah, man, go to integrityhg.com. That's the best place to get in touch with us and kind of see what types of deals we're doing, what types of deals we've done in the past, uh, learn more about our core values and the nonprofits that we support. And, uh, And if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, then make sure you reach out. Boom. So guys, this was an awesome episode. You've made it to the end. And I thank you. I appreciate you for giving me your most precious resource on the planet, which is your time. So if you found this to be a super valuable episode, don't be stingy. Share it with your friends, your family members, 
Leave us a rating and review, send us your comments. And most importantly, go check out Steven's podcast and uh, their website, which will be links in the show notes. Um, it was nice. And I'll see you soon. Cheers. If you call me.